Stay hungry, stay foolish. Startups have changed the world. In the United States, many startups such as Tesla, Apple and Amazon have become household names. The economic value of startups has doubled since 1992 and is projected to double again in the next 15 years. For decades, the hot center of this phenomenon has been Silicon Valley. This is changing fast. Thanks to technology, startups are now taking root everywhere, from Delhi to Detroit, to Nairobi to Sao Paulo. Yet despite this globalization of startup activity, our knowledge of how to build successful startups is still drawn primarily from Silicon Valley. We welcome author of Out Innovate, how global entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are rewriting the rules of Silicon Valley. Alexandre Lazaro, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you on the show and good news for our audience today. I have a copy of Out Innovate to give away just by signing up to the Innovation Show website and newsletter on theinnovationshow.io. I'm going to start somewhere I rarely do, and it's with your dedication, because you dedicate the book to men and women in the arena. And then you quote this beautiful Theodore Roosevelt quote as follows. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions? Who spends himself in a worthy cause? Who at best knows in the end of triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. I absolutely love this way you start the book. I have one quote on my fridge, and it's this one here. And it's been meaningful for me my whole career. And the reason it's meaningful for me is I'm a venture capitalist by day. I invest in startups with one foot in the valley and one foot uh, around the world. And the thing I do most often and the thing I like the least about my job is that I meet great entrepreneurs for, for whatever reason, the entrepreneurial opportunity is just not a fit for my day job, for my work. Um, it might be too early. It's not the right industry focus, whatever. And I think it's so important that I always remember that the credit is due to the man or woman in the arena and that entrepreneurs are really putting themselves out there and building a business and looking to change the world. And I think that's why it's so important for me to remember that. And that's why it's on my fridge. And the reason I started the book with it is that I wanted the readers of this book to also take that lens as well of, look, we are going to take this attitude of learning from entrepreneurs around the world and what are some of their best practices. And some of these uh, businesses have scaled and succeeded. Others have stumbled and had harder times. But either way, the credit is due to the entrepreneurs that look to build this. And I wanted that value statement being the first thing that we start the book with. This book is a must read for startups and VCs alike all over the world. And for those people involved in the ecosystems around them, I love the story you share of Xavier Helgeson and how many Silicon Valley investors could not get behind the notion that his company could break the Silicon Valley paradigm so extensively and still succeed. And this story really shares that breaking of the paradigm that is so necessary. I start the book with this story. It's about a startup at the time called Off Grid Electric. Now it's called Zola, which offers solar home systems to the unelectrified around the world. So it blew my mind to find out that 1.2 billion people don't have access to power. That means when the sun goes down, there is no light. When the sun goes down, there is no air conditioning. There's no fan. There's no TV. There is darkness. Um, except for burning kerosene or some of these other uh, other, other methods. Um, uh, and what this business wanted to do was change that. And so imagine a couple solar panels, a battery, um, some cell phone chargers, a TV, etc. Essentially a whole modern lighting system based on solar that is underpinned by three technologies at the same time. One, obviously, 
is the rapid decrease in solar and battery costs that makes these home systems possible. The second is the proliferation of mobile money, because most of the families that are buying these cannot afford to buy a couple hundred dollar system, but they can afford a couple dollars a day or a week, the same amount of money they're spending on kerosene for their lights. And third, IoT and an ability to do a remote diagnostic because it would be way too expensive to go and send someone in person to go visit each one of these if they broke. And so this business model was possible because three technological trends were happening at the same time. But this model looks totally different than a software only Silicon Valley startup that wants to grow at any cost. There's a lot of differences to this. And so when I had met Xavier, when he was building this business in the early days, it was one of these moments that really catalyzed my understanding of just how radically different the most successful entrepreneurs around the world, what their business models look like and what it takes to succeed. And this started this conversation and this reflection about what it was that will help these businesses succeed, what it is that works over the long term for them. And spoiler alert, it isn't following the Silicon Valley playbook. Like you say, somebody like Xavier has to totally do things differently because the ecosystems for him, even to find investment, don't exist. And they have to create those. They have to rally political support. They have to rally banking support. So let's jump into what you mean by a frontier innovator. Yeah, happily. And so you know, I think at the highest level, one, one could say entrepreneurship is exploding around the world, right? Some studies talk about 400 million entrepreneurs around the world, 6% of the, of the planet are entrepreneurs. Um, in the book, I'm talking about frontier innovators. And so there's two subsets of that that are important. Let's talk about frontier and let's talk about innovators. We'll start with the latter. When I talk about innovators in this book, I'm really talking about entrepreneurs of opportunity. So people that are leaving whatever they are doing to build a startup, to build a business because they see an opportunity in the market. Two, businesses that are looking to solve a problem using technology and business model innovation as part of it. And three, critically, it's also businesses that aspire to scale their operation. It's not a single location type of thing. It's really an aspiration to build something meaningful and big. So that's what I mean by innovator. And then frontier, you know, obviously this is a very nebulous term. And this is, when I talk about frontier, I'm really talking about this new frontier of innovation around the world. There's now 480 startup ecosystems around the world. But 10 years ago, you would have been correct in saying, look, all the action is in Silicon Valley or a handful of other ecosystems. Uh, only four ecosystems have created billion dollar businesses. Today, 84 startup ecosystems around the world, 84 countries have created billion dollar businesses. There are 480 of these startup ecosystems around the world. There's a million startups around the world. And so in the frontier, um, my argument is that the best entrepreneurs outside of Silicon Valley and a lot of these emerging startup ecosystems have more in common, right? An entrepreneur in, in uh, Detroit or Chicago or Amsterdam or Bangalore or Nairobi has more in common with each other or with the best entrepreneurs in Sao Paulo than they do with those in San, San Francisco. And so that's what I mean by the frontier. And obviously, those cities I mentioned – is a really heterogeneous bunch. They all look different. And so if I was going to grossly oversimplify it, I'd say, look, if you map a two by two matrix, you say on the one hand, developed market versus developing market, and on the other, developed startup ecosystem versus developing startup ecosystem. Top right, you might say, look, that's where Silicon Valley is, right? It's a developed country, and it's a very developed startup ecosystem. You might put a handful of other places there, right? Maybe New York or London, Tel Aviv. Bottom left in my book, I take us as far as Pyongyang in, in North Korea, believe it or not. But also, you know, you might say, look, there's startup ecosystems in Zambia, right, where I, I, I talk about one example, a very developing country and very nascent startup ecosystem, the very exact opposite. And so in the book, I use some of these strong opposites to really pull at the differences. But there's obviously a lot of nuances too. think of a market like Bangalore, right, in a developing context, but very developed startup ecosystem. It just looks different. Right. Or, you know, I'm from Winnipeg, a, a small, medium sized city in, in the middle of Canada, a developed country, but very nascent startup ecosystem, also different dynamics. Um, and so in the book, I use some of these more nuanced differences to pull at that. You know, we obviously oversimplify the frontier to be this set of emerging startup ecosystems. When I write the sequel, I'll have to do a bunch more double clicks for this as the startup ecosystems around the world <laughs> continue to scale. So many of these organizations, so many of these startups, are changing the world. And there's a 
global rally cry, which is startups can change the world. And you say in the book, it's preached with religious fervor, but it's not unfounded. And I quote you here and you say, in the United States, companies founded by entrepreneurs and often supported by VC money include household names like Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. And now 40% of publicly traded US companies listed after 1979 were once startups. Entrepreneurship is a driving force for employment. In the US alone, entrepreneurship is responsible for all net new jobs created in the past decade and in all but seven years since 1977. I think that's a critical point. We need to plant the seeds for the future by investing in startups and changing our mindset about them. Absolutely. And I think what's really exciting about the data is, and and we will see this topic studied increasingly in years to come in the academic sphere. And so fast forward a couple of years, what I would predict we will hear is as the startup innovation ecosystems continue to globalize and around the world, as we continue to see successful startups getting built in these emerging startup ecosystems, the same dynamics will be true. We will see growth in employment driven by this. We will see a push towards innovation. But also, one of the things that I think is exciting is that the best entrepreneurs outside the Valley are taking a different attitude to the problems they are solving. And by and large, I believe they are creators, not disruptors. They're taking this lens of looking to solve some of the uh, biggest challenges through technological innovation and doing it so creatively. And so we're also going to see a lot of social impact as a result of it too. Well, let's jump into the playbook because through your studies, through your travels throughout the world as a VC, but also as a lecturer, you have written a playbook, some themes and some rules that these frontier innovators follow. And your book explores 10 elements. We won't get through them all today, but I'd love to share a few of them, starting with this brilliant one, which is create this concept of creation rather than disruption. I was shocked to read in your book that in 2014, more than half the world does not have addresses. In Kenya, where this startup called Timbo is based, only 2% of all buildings had them. And to put that in context, you share that the average ambulance response time in Nairobi is more than two hours versus six minutes and 10 seconds in New York. And a large part of the problem is improper location and addressing causing ambulances to circulate for critical minutes to find an exact location. And then you bring it to a more trivial element, which is a lack of addresses stalls commerce. And it takes 3.1 phone calls for a KFC delivery and 1.4 calls per ride for an Uber pickup. And to solve this problem, you share the great story of a company called Timbo, a technology-driven startup that creates addresses where there are none. I think this is one of those things when we reflect on what it takes to innovate. It's important to remember how different the context is in a lot of ecosystems, right? And addresses is a really great example. If you don't have an address, you know, never mind just having not being able to get services in critical times with ambulances, but it's tough to do a lot of services we, th- we take for granted, um, any type of delivery, the postal service, but also even applying for a bank account. Um, it's really hard to apply for a bank account if you also have to write your address down and you don't have one. And that's a requirement. And so this is a really big challenge. And the story um, here is of an entrepreneur in Kenya that's looking to build this through technological innovation and creating it. And so this raises the question of what do I mean by creators? And also... What does that mean in relation to what happens in the Valley um, disruption? Let's start there, um, which is this notion of disruption. It was started through research with Clayton Christensen, um, the, uh, the academic at Harvard Business School, but not, not in the software industry, actually in the steel industry, where he observed that in the steel industry, uh, integrated steel mills were getting, quote, disrupted at the low end of the market, at their most unprofitable area by these mini mills. But over time, the mini bills took over the entire market, um, starting with a small little bit and then and scaling. It's this incredibly emotionally appealing story. It's a modern day David and Goliath of the small, valiant player at the low end of the market succeeding and scaling by offering a better product, by being more nimble and by better serving customers. And what's happened in the Valley is that we've taken disruption and it's become more than a approach, it's kind of a flag-waving philosophy. And it defines the types of problems that entrepreneurs seek to solve, where they look for a big market, where there is a inefficient 
solution that can be disrupted with so a software solution. And those are the problems that are getting solved. And yet in emerging markets, what we see is the opposite. We see the best entrepreneurs solving problems um, like Timbo, um, solving addresses. And so what's happening is, you know, if you look at the best entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, right, the largest companies, less than 20% of them are in critical industries like financial services or agriculture or energy or healthcare. If you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, that number is over 60%. The types of problems getting solved are totally different. They're, they are creators. And so what do I mean by creators specifically? Um, it's entrepreneurs that do three things simultaneously. The first is they are um, offering a product or service that was previously not available or at least not available in the formal economy. Two, they're doing it uh, for the mass market. And three, they are often the shoulders of giants upon which others build. If a business like um, OK High Scales, um, that means that others can scale on top of it, leveraging this, leveraging this platform. So they are, they are these, these, the shoulders of giants as they, as they scale. I mean, that's what I mean by, by being a creator and by building a business. And I think we're going to see more of those types of entrepreneurs getting built in emerging startup ecosystems around the world. That's almost more important because we need to create a surplus of jobs, a surplus of enterprise because of the threat of artificial intelligence. I thought this is really important because rather than disrupt existing incumbents, existing businesses, we need to create on top of them. And I thought this is such an important aspect of the creation versus disruption. But let's move on because there's loads in here. Because you talk next about this idea called the first mover disadvantage. And there's a great saying that the second mouse gets the cheese. And you illustrate this using the story of m -Pesa. The company was by no means an overnight success and encountered financial, social, cultural, political, technological, and regulatory roadblocks along its way to success. Yeah. And so first, you know, what is m -Pesa? They are the leading mobile, plat mobile payments platform um, also in Kenya. And uh, they're not a traditional entrepreneurial story. They were um, built by intrapreneurs within Safaricom. The seed investor was actually uh, money from uh, uh, the British aid agency. And what essentially they created was an ecosystem where people could use um, feature phones, right? Simple, you know, simple phones, not smartphones to essentially have a modern banking experience. And uh, one of the quotes I like um, uh, around this story was, was, you know, uh, around how do you convince a shopkeeper to open up their till and give money to someone that comes and shows an SMS code? Cause that's essentially what was happening is people would SMS money and, uh, it would be held in the cloud, uh, in, in virtual wallets. And all these little shops were essentially ATMs that you could go and cash in, cash out. And so you really had to build uh, trust around the system that you could give money out to someone and uh, that would be okay because you would then have money in your, in your own wallet. And so that's one of the challenges um, around building startups. But I think that one of the macro lessons in the book, if I was going to take a step back, is that the best entrepreneurs outside the Valley have to do more with less. And so in this case, right, they have to um, do all these things really and, and change behavior is part of it. But at the end of the day, because they've done that, they're also... They also have a range of advantages. And one of them is, you know, they are able to get support from a range of other ecosystem players. They're um, uh, able to build a new market uh, rather than disrupt another one. And, and, uh, and so it, in, in the end, this has ended up being a really, really successful business. Um, there's a lot of these reasons why taking this attitude of being a creator can yield and lead to um, incredible outcomes and incredible impact that also translate into advantages. Um, and, and, and this is this push-pull that we will feel throughout the book as well, of turning adversity um, into advantages in some of these ecosystems. So let's jump then, Alex, to an idea you call fostering the full stack, where frontier innovators don't just rely on the software. Here you say, in Silicon Valley's classic model, startups are asset light. In Silicon Valley, best practice suggests following a software-based asset light product or service. Startups are told to focus on their wedge, that narrow segment in the market in which they will compete and hopefully dominate. Providing a full end-to-end -end experience is a bold, expensive, and often foolhardy strategy. But frontier innovators often need to construct the vertical full stack all by themselves, developing both the ultimate product or service and the enabling infrastructure that underpins it 
And this is why it takes so much more resilience, so much more investment and so much more time. And I appreciate you asking me this question because it's, it's a perfect segue in some ways to the last one, which is having to do more with less and that being both more challenging, but also turning it into advantages. And let me tell you the story of one entrepreneur, which is the story of Guia Bolso in Brazil. So Guia Bolso is trying to build what's called a personal finance manager. So in the US, we have apps like Mint.com uh, or Credit Karma. Uh, Mint.com allows you to see all your bank accounts in one place, understand who you owe money to when the bills are coming, things like that. Credit Karma allows you to understand your credit score and, and do similar things. In the US, to build a business like that, you have to connect to people's bank accounts. Well, it turns out there's actually a lot of infrastructure that exists already that allows you to do it. If you want to monetize, you can offer your customers better offers. And there's a lot of players that are willing to acquire customers in a digital format and, and interact with that kind of, kind of app. And by the way, there's a really big credit scoring infrastructure. A business like Guia Bolso uh, had a much harder hand dealt to them because in all those cases, that infrastructure didn't exist. So the first thing is they wanted to build an app to give people access to understanding their bank accounts. Well, there is no way to connect to all the bank accounts, or at least there wasn't in Brazil at the time. And so they had to build it themselves. And so they had to build this bank interconnection layer. And then next, when they wanted to give people insights into you know, their credit worthiness, because a lot of people were saying, well, you know, I, you know, I have this high cost debt, or I have this or this, and I'd like to optimize, what should I do? They had to give insights to that. But there is no credit score at the time in Brazil. There's only a blacklist. You're either on it or you're not. Um, and so they had to give insights into the customers and build some of that as well. And there also wasn't an ecosystem of fintechs or traditional financial services incumbents who were willing to lend. And so they had to really build that ecosystem themselves too to monetize. So they had to do all three of those to be able to just do the one thing. So it makes the mountain that much harder to climb. But in the similar way as we talked about the creator's advantage, um, this also gives advantages too. On the one hand, it's a moat, right? It's a little bit of this full stack moat because once you built a lot of this infrastructure, it's harder for others to do it. You've raised a lot of capital for it. There's less venture capitalists there. It's less likely that a competitor will also get funded for a similar business that's much, much smaller. And, uh, and because you're doing something that has this creator's lens, et cetera, you're also able to leverage some help in the ecosystem potentially too. That's a little bit of the dynamic of having to build a vertical stack and that being very painful, but also, you know, over the long term, potentially leading to some advantages as well. Focusing on the idea of the horizontal stack, the reason I like this and I see it as I do the career of the future, because we need to be more horizontal. We need to have more than just one skill. And here, startup example that you give us is Nadiem Makarim, I'm butchering these names, I'm sure, had to build, had to do this when he built Gojek horizontally, offering related business models that mutually reinforced the core offering. Let's share a bit about this. This is a fantastic story. Yeah, happily. And so, you know, firstly, this full stack concept that we're talking about, you know, the most obvious manifestation of it is this vertical stack of having to build enabling infrastructure to do it. But one of the things that I've observed in the best startups around the world is that often they're, they're building this horizontal stack as well. So they're building um, a set of offerings. Because the market uh, uh, gaps are so large, the way to serve customers is to offer this ecosystem around. And so the story of Nadim is really interesting. So first, what is Gojek? They are a, um, a startup now, a, a scaled company um, that started in Indonesia um, that is in the ride sharing. Um, industry. But instead of it being kind of an Uber-like model with cars, I mean, in Indonesia, um, it is around Ojex, and that's why it's called Gojek. Um, Ojex are motorcycle taxis, and there's a really big informal industry of these motorcycle taxis. And uh, what Nadim had built was an ecosystem to enable people to call them and drive more business for them, etc. But his vision was actually much broader. And it was this idea that, well, if you build this ecosystem, and you give some of these drivers more jobs, um, more rides during the day, that's interesting, but could you do more? And, uh, and so the way the Gojek ecosystem has evolved today is that it isn't just ride sharing. Nadim's vision is in the morning, we'll drive people to work. At lunch, we'll deliver food. In the evening, we'll drive people back to back home. Um, in the evening, perhaps you could deliver food. During the day, you can deliver e-commerce um, or services, including, for instance, uh, financial products and services. And so they launched uh, GoPay, 
which is similar to M-Pesa that we talked about earlier, where the drivers can be cash in cash out points for people. And so are a network of humanity ATMs. Um, and so uh, Gojek had to do more um, as well. Um, but in the end, this creates a really powerful ecosystem. And by the way, I'll, I'll make one aside, which is um, one of the things I don't like is that people talk a lot about how ideas come from Silicon Valley and get copied everywhere around the world. I think the story of Gojek is really a great example of this new phenomenon where ideas come from everywhere and get improved as they get uh, tested and built around the world. And so while Gojek had some inspiration around ride sharing, their model of ecosystem was fundamentally different than the original Uber model, in some ways borrowed from the super app model in China um, that WeChat and things like that um, had built. And by the way, the Gojek model has now influenced and inspired the originals. And it's no surprise that the fastest growing segments at Uber are around food delivery. And they also tried with uh, building a wallet and a range of these other services too. And so I think that's one of the things that's also really exciting uh, to see is where inspiration is coming from around the world. One of the things you say here is when they build trust, then they can leverage that trust. It's not just that their capability, but it's the trust in the brand. And then you can leverage the brand elsewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in some ways, one of the challenges of being a creator is that it's harder. On the other is, particularly in emerging markets, because there are so many different market gaps. If you build a brand and a trusted relationship with uh, customers and a way to reach them, and they like the interaction, they are often willing to have a couple different interactions with you. You can also start, start your way towards building an ecosystem. Frugality is a huge part of these frontier innovators. And I'd love if we could take the opportunity to share the idea of camels versus unicorns, but also taking a little an aside here to share with our audience the origin of the word unicorn, because many won't know why these startups are called unicorns, but also the newer term, which is a decacorn. Yeah, well, so it's interesting. The unicorn word, I think it one, on the one hand, has a numerical meaning. It means a startup that's worth a billion dollars. But it also has a philosophical underpinning where to build a unicorn is also an approach, a style, a philosophy towards how to do it. And if that's the philosophy, the method is growth. It's growth at any cost. It's okay to uh, focus on growth with unsustainable economics. It's okay to burn lots of capital in service of growth. It's okay to take a short-term approach to building your business in service of growth. That's the philosophy of building unicorns of growth at any cost. And the Decacorn is a, a $10 billion business numerically, but underpinned by the same philosophy. And so what I tried to talk about in the book is this notion of being a camel. Um, and it's this idea of building sustainability and resilience into the business model from day one. It isn't about growth at any cost. It's about sustainable and resilient, balanced growth over time. And why did I choose the camel? You know, the camel is an animal that can survive some of the harshest environments around the world. It can survive in the deserts and around, around the world. But also, when there's water, it can drink faster than other any animal. And it can sprint very rapidly. And so when times are good, it can scale very quickly. Um, and when times are bad, it is built on a foundation of strength that lets it endure over the long term. And so that's where this notion of being a camel is. So let me give you one example which is uh, the case of Grubhub. I often think of on-demand food delivery as an incredibly venture subsidized model, like DoorDash raised $1.5 billion. Grubhub comparatively raised a paltry less than $80 million. It was founded in Chicago. And uh, when I interviewed Mike Evans, the COO and co-founder, he talked a lot about how philosophically they looked to build sustainability and resilience from the get-go. And every single fundraise they did was at a point where they were sustainable and for a very specific purpose. It was to expand to a couple other cities, to do a small acquisition, what have you. Um, it took them about 10 years to exit to IPO. And I asked Mike, I said, you know, why didn't you do this faster? Why didn't you raise a little bit more money and accelerate? And he said, look, I could have done it in eight years, but I would have done so at meaningfully more risk. And that's, what I'm, that's really what I'm talking about in the book. I think that we have this um, fallacy where we see all these big startups and these success stories that, are, that have grown at any cost. We say, well, they did it this way, and therefore, that is the answer. But what we don't know is 
the counterfactual to the story. You know, if you replay that story a hundred times, how many of those times taking this growth at all cost methodology, would you get the outcome that we just happened to see here versus the amount of times where the company would not have succeeded? And I believe that using a camel approach gives us a better risk adjusted outcome, gives us a more likely likelihood over a hundred times of getting to meaningful, large, sustainable, great companies, enduring companies by taking that approach versus the unicorn one. And that's really what I'm what I'm talking about in, in the book with this, this camel approach. One of the reasons I mentioned the camel and it's so relevant today in the current times we're experiencing now because we are in a drought of sorts. We need to conserve our water in, in a way. And I'd love if you'd share in this current pandemic how you see the lessons from the frontier innovators panning out across the world. And particularly for places like Sil- the Valley, where the paradigm is different and it needs to change. You know, I wrote this book in a completely different context, and I was rallying against this growth at all costs methodology, believing that, you know, it, it might make sense for a very small handful of startups where it is truly winner takes all markets. And there's a lot of capital going uh, to competitors to be taking this growth at all costs methodology. I think it works for a very small set, but I think that for most startups, it isn't appropriate. And what's interesting is the context has changed. When I wrote the book, I was Silicon Valley was a context of abundance. The times were good. There was lots of capital and businesses were in, in, in great shape. But the context has shifted, right, to this context of adversity. And as the best entrepreneurs in the Valley are looking to build more enduring businesses and weave sustainability and resilience into their business model as well, there aren't that many great models in Silicon Valley on how to do that. And this is really the point is that best practice around this is global. And that best practice already exists with the best entrepreneurs that have had to do this in ecosystems of adversity all along. Looking to and learning from the best entrepreneurs around the world gives us a playbook on how to navigate the crisis in Silicon Valley, but you know, obviously all around the world too. I love that you've done this. You've taken the best from all around the world and also in doing so encouraged the people in different countries as well, because oftentimes people are comparing themselves to the Valley and kind of going, I wish it was like that. And you're going, no, wait a second. You have some advantages that they don't have. And you give a great example. I live in Ireland, which is a pretty small ecosystem, but you give a great example of a country like we're aware of, for example, Estonia, who totally made itself a digital country, digital passports, digital identity system, etc. But Rwanda is one that many of our listeners won't be familiar with, which is awesome example. And what I think is really interesting is that outside of the valley, the playbook looks different on how to build a startup and having to do more with less again. And this is a good example. It's having to be born global. In the US, entrepreneurs are lucky. They have a massive trillion dollar economy to tackle 380 uh, million person market or or whatever the updated number is. But um, for many entrepreneurs operating around the world, um, like entrepreneurs in, in Dublin or in Estonia, um, the local market might be too small. And so entrepreneurs need to build in a born global way from the get-go. They need to figure out how to build a product that and service that can scale across borders and, and that works uh, around the world to be able to build a bigger TAM. And there's a bunch of different ways that manifests itself. Um, And I think the Rwandan story is interesting. Rwanda has become a market that welcomes innovation and has become a testing ground for innovators that want to launch in Africa. Companies like Zipline start in Rwanda with their drone delivery of blood and healthcare products as a way to, to start, test the product, figure out if it works, and then go elsewhere. And there's numerous other stories like that for, for Rwanda. And I believe that this skill set of being born global is critical for entrepreneurs outside the Valley. And it also leads to some of these companies that out-innovate their Silicon Valley peers. Let me give you one example to that that I I just think is really interesting. It's a story of UiPath, which is a robotic process automation business. So RPA is bots to automate white collar work, taking something from this spreadsheet, dropping it somewhere else that's massive oversimplification, but that that kind of approach of, of, of automating work. It was started in uh, Romania, Daniel Dines, the CEO, 
who I interviewed for this, talked about how the fact that he had to be born global was critical to their success because they had to build a product that could scale across borders, that could be localized, that could sell across borders. And today, the business is arguably the fastest growing enterprise business of all times and the biggest in, the, in this massive category and bigger than its Silicon Valley peers. And so the fact that it started in a smaller market um, was part of the reason that it was able to succeed over time by being born global. One thing I wanted to ask you, we touched on it earlier on, and we've talked about it on previous shows, is innovation teams within organizations, established organizations, are coming under pressure as the economic environment comes under pressure. But equally, startups are going to come under pressure. Scale-ups are going to come under pressure. What is your advice for them to navigate these uncertain times? Yeah, well, so first of all, my, my heart goes out. Um, to entrepreneurs that are having to navigate this crisis, to the men and women in the arena, um, to harken back to the beginning of our episode. Um, but I'd say, look, I think we have an opportunity to learn from how some of the best startup entrepreneurs that have scaled through ecosystems of adversity, how they've done it and apply it to this ecosystem. And I'd say, look, there's probably two lessons that I think are particularly uh, important. Um, and the first uh, is tied to this camel notion of building with sustainability and resilience in mind, having sustainable unit economics, managing burn, but also remembering to take a long-term outlook to the work. I um, mean, the second is, and, and this is partially a hope um, as well, which is this notion of being a creator, building businesses that have social impact as part of it. I think that COVID has laid bare some of the biggest challenges in the world. In the United States, for instance, where I live, um, it's not new that there are 60 million Americans that are underbanked or unbanked. It's not new that there's 80 million Americans that are underinsured. None of these challenges are new, but all of a sudden we've seen why those challenges are so important in the ability to deliver uh, benefits to those folks or healthcare or whatever it is. Um, And so I hope that what we will do is we will change the lens around some of these problems and see these are big challenges but they are also really big opportunities for entrepreneurs and innovators, both at big companies and and, and startups alike, to tackle. And so I hope that we take this opportunity to shift the types of problems that are getting solved and focus more on being creators with impact and really hopefully building things that leave the world a better place. Before I close out today, I just want to remind our audience, I have a copy of this brilliant book, up for grabs. If you just sign up to the, the innovation show.io newsletter on the innovation show.io, you can be in with a chance of winning. Alex, where can people find out more about you, your book, your newsletters, etc.? Yeah, happily. So you can sign up for my newsletter at alexlazaro.com, A L E X L A Z A R O W.com, or follow me on Twitter at Alex Lazaro. And you can find my book anywhere where books are sold, on Amazon notably, but um, given the crisis, I encourage you to support your local small business and bookstore and, uh, and buy it there. So uh, really excited to hear your feedback from your listeners and enjoy the show. Thank you so much for having me. Author of Out Innovate, How Global Entrepreneurs from Delhi to Detroit are Rewriting the Rules of Silicon Valley. Alex Lazaro, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun.